Um, so thank you everyone for joining us this morning um, for this presentation by Mr. Andrew Sheng. Um, my name is Pallavi Nuka. I'm the Associate Director of the Julius Rubinwitz Center for Public Policy and Finance. Um, so I, first of all, I want to thank um, Chang Boon Lee, who is a second year master's student here at the School of Public and International Affairs for um, inviting it, Mr. Sheng and prompting us to have this uh, discussion with him. Um, before, I'm going to hand it over to Chang Boon in a minute. Um, before I do, I just want to say, since we have a fairly small group, I encourage everyone to turn on your cameras um, so uh, we can have um, a, a lively discussion. Feel free to unmute and ask questions. Um, after Chang Boon in introduces Dr. Shang, we'll go around and um, just have everyone quickly introduce themselves as well. And I think we can handle this quite informally. Uh, Mr. Shang has uh, a slide presentation that he'll go through and then um, we'll open up for question and answer period. All right, Chang Boon, over to you. Well, thanks, Palavi. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Um, just to set the stage, uh, in February, the Julius Rabinowi Center, we had just completed our annual conference on achieving the net zero 2050 targets. And during the conference, there were very keen discussions on the subject of climate finance. And the questions we often receive uh, would include, like, what about developing countries? You know, what about small and medium-sized companies? that would also like to tap into sustainable finance. And one of the most important sustainable finance innovations we have out there. Um, the audience, uh, we are very keen to know more. And so today we are very honored to have with us today, um, Mr. Andrew Sheng. All of you have seen Mr. Andrew Sheng's back uh, profile when you register, but just to refresh, Mr. Sheng has held many important positions. So in relation to our topic today, Mr. Sheng is an advisor to the United Nations Environment Program inquiry into the design of a sustainable financial system. He's also currently a distinguished fellow of the Asia Global Institute at the University of Hong Kong. Among others, Mr. Sheng's experiences include being the chief advisor to the China Banking Regulatory Commission, a board member of Kazana National Berhad, the Sovereign Wealth Fund of Malaysia, a member of the International Advisory Council of China Investment Corporation, the China Development Bank, China Securities Regulatory Commission and the Securities Exchange and Exchange Board of India. And around the time of Asian financial crisis, Mr. Sheng actually served as the chairman of the Securities and Futures Commission of Hong Kong from 1998 to 2005. And before that, he was a central banker with the Hong Kong Monetary Authority and Bank Nagara Malaysia. He also worked with the World Bank and chaired the technical committee of the International Organization of Securities Commission, IOSCO, which is like the UN for Securities Commission. Um, so our topic today is sustainable finance, but we are definitely eager to engage uh, Mr. Shane in the future um, on his expertise on global finance and policy. And so this is the introduction um, about Mr. Shane. And as Pala, we mentioned, it'd be great uh, if all of us could also introduce ourselves because this is quite an intimate group. Um, my name is Chang Boon Lee, you can call me Chang Boon. I used to work at the Malaysian Securities Commission uh, on promoting uh, green finance uh, in Malaysia, as well as uh, in the region in Southeast Asia, including the development of the ASEAN Green Bond Standards. And I'll stop here and- it's This one. All right. Uh, I want to thank uh, Plavi and uh, Chang Boon for uh, giving me this opportunity to uh, talk to the Julius uh, Rabinovitz Center for Public Policy. This is a um, a uh, very important topic. And uh, Sneha and I have been Zooming almost weekly with a group of uh, people who are very committed on how to deliver sustainable finance projects on the ground. Okay. Now, as you know, I mean, this I'm going to go through very fast because we, what I will try to do, uh, because a lot of you know all this stuff, but the second half of this presentation is something what we're, we're, we're trying to do on the ground. First of all, I, I, you know, Greater Thunberg is, uh, is leading the charge, a lot of blah, blah, and the politicians are talking, but there's less walking. Okay, sorry, Rahul, you, 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 you're, you're talking. Okay. Um, anyway, uh, as you know, the biggest, the toughest problem of climate change is an it's an entangled systems change, and you can't solve it in parts. 
And that's why, you know, uh, uh, you know, we're all frustrated, individuals, including companies, as well as nations. And because, you know, the solving um, uh, climate change is, is very much like all to, we are all in a collective action trap. And a system has basically four parts. I mean, it's, it's the way, way I, 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 I divide it. The meta, which is the thinking part, you know, uh, if, 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 if you are looking at the problem wrongly, you'll never solve it. There's the macro, which is the big picture. Then there's the mezzo. The mezzo is the institutional part that links the macro policy to the micro. Unfortunately, institutions very often, as Keynes used to say, have, are, 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 are trapped by professors who are 30, 40 years dead. And so they are very lagged in actually implementation. And so institutions tend to protect the status quo, rather realizing that we are, business as usual is dead. And you know, we, we are all at the micro level. And of course, God is perfect. We want the PAP to do everything perfect, but we cannot achieve it because the devil is in the details. It's not about vision. Vision without execution is delusion, okay? Uh, and so execution is all about the last mile problem. How do we solve that? All right. And that's what I, you know, I've been working on. During the pandemic, I helped produce this book, Buying Time for Climate Change, which just came out just before uh, uh, um, Glasgow uh, COP26. Uh, the introductory chapter was by Sir Martin Rees, the uh, astronomer royal. Uh, and uh, of course, I recommend you, know, you all read this because all we focused on was, <laughs> look, <laughs> we're running out of time. We're running out of time. And we, you know, uh, 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 in fact, you know, some people say we only have 10 years, uh, but we, we only go to carbon neutral by 2050 and uh, maybe uh, 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 neutral for India by 2070. Okay. But the bottom line is, you know, water is being polluted, air is being polluted, energy, there's enough energy, but all in fossil fuels, uh, most of it in fossil fuels, uh, minerals are running out, uh, and the topsoil is eroding, okay? The, a top scientist told me that we only have 60 seasons to correct the topsoil. After that, you know, our, our food production is going to, going to literally just very quickly go downhill. Now, the bottom line of the, the, our two-year analysis of this from experts on water, on food, on uh, complexity, you know, on urban planning, you know, on uh, uh, all these issues on finance, was that there is no shortage of technical knowledge. But unfortunately, it's all available in silos. So the knowledge is not available at the people at the coalface, people who are doing the climate change action, okay? You know, a lot of them are in top universities like Princeton, right? But if I am in working in Ladakh, I don't know what you know, right? I just don't have no idea. And I'm short of funding, but you know, central banks can print $7 trillion in a matter of days, okay, during the pandemic. It, it made the 1% 25 to 30% richer and you know, 150 million people during the pandemic went into poverty, okay? But you know, asset-wise, the cyber currency is created two and a half trillion dollars. But money, you know, as the as the as the poet said, water, water everywhere, and not a drop to drink, right? It's not available where we need it. So what is broken is the transmission channel of central banks printing the money going to where it is needed. All right, you we've seen this in advanced markets, whereby the poor people can't get the money even during the pandemic, right? Because they get it in form of checks. And when they cash the check, you know, the guy who cashed the check may cut a 10% discount, right? You know, for, for the guy. So, you know, how do we make that uh, uh, difficulty? Well, either we act or we burn together, right? We're all in a boiling uh, a frog issue. You know that very well. And, you know, this, was, uh, uh, this idea was given to me by the Costa Rican uh, Minister of uh, um, uh, Environment. She said, why are we building sandcastles on the beach when the tsunami is coming? And now we see this, right? We've got COVID-19, then we got recession, 
And now we've got climate change, and maybe behind is the World War Three. Okay, I mean, all this is crazy, okay? Right, we are apes, uh, alphas, uh, fighting in a burning forest, all right? So, the, the, you know, this is the uh, Department of National Intelligence, Global Trends of 2040. Climate change, environment degradation, and eroding human sec uh, security are all interacting in such a way that we are, you know, going for exponential uh, 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 warming with, you know, more natural disasters, you know, uh, uh, more uh, human, uh, human created uh, uh, failures leading to um, um, a, a combination of both is creating civil conflict and then widening to global conflict, right? And where does finance come into this? Well, you know, we're printing money. And, you know, the, this was given, this, this idea came from a Swedish forester who was trying to get finance to invest in his forests, not, you know, regeneration. He said the natural capital return is only linear 3% per annum, but the investor wants the minimum of 12%. So how do you get the difference? Well, finance 101, leverage. And that's why we are leveraging all the time. And so what is causing you know, excess uh, uh, carbon emission? The answer is excess consumption. How do we get excess consumption? Very simple, excess debt. As long as we create debt, we consume the future now. So we're, you know, we're literally in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a very difficult position, right? Difficult position. So as you all know this, I mean, so I'm, I'm gonna very quickly go through this, right? The consumption is now outpacing the available resource. If every 7.8 billion per, uh, population in the world consumes like the average American or the European, we need three Earths by 2030, okay? We can't carry on like this. And now we've got inflation, you know, we've got uh, spending more on military, we're, you know, on defense, we're really, you know, having serious problems. And the real danger is captured green finance with brown hearts. Now, during COP26, you know, the, there was a, you know, climate, uh, fi climate finance, the task force on, on climate uh, change. Hundred uh, fourteen trillion dollars, you know, going to enforce. This is again the tail wagging the dog, right? They're going to say we're going to enforce ESG standards. Hello, who sets the standards? If I am a, one of the multinationals, I am an a, a energy company. I can pay the best PR company to tell you how I am green when I'm still brown. We've seen this for the last 20, 30 years when tobacco companies, pesticide companies, chemical companies all told the companies, you got nothing wrong, nothing to worry about, et cetera, et cetera. And yet the, the people at the coalface, at the, at, at the front, our indigenous people who live with nature are dying. The forests are being killed, right? They're being cut down, you know, uh, so what do we do about it? So if you know, if you really look at you know, even in 2017, most countries remain focused on brown finance, and the reason is very straightforward. Until very recently, the largest corporations thought that ESG was a, 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 a expenditure, a cost, not a profit opportunity, right? And so you know, e and then suddenly everybody wants to be green, so they want to buy ESG-linked debt. Hello debt doesn't solve problems. You don't give a drug addict more drugs. The, the world is now living on more and more debt. We have to use equity because equity enables you to cushion risks. Debt just simply transfer the, the, the risk. So guess what? You know, I was part of that group you know, in the UN, UN who basically said, you know, we need very clear targets. So it was, you know, sort of, uh, evolved 17 UN SDGs, but this is very high level. How do we translate this 17 UN SDGs into millions of enterprises on the ground, social enterprises, as well as businesses, not just the multinationals, but really the middle, the bulge bracket who really now need to meet this uh, ESG, 
And suddenly you, you, you literally hold a stick in front of them. If you don't comply with ESG, I won't lend to you and I won't invest in you. Hello, whose money is that? Isn't the real situation that money is flowing uphill? The poor countries are now investing more and more money in the rich markets who are running fiscal and balance of payments deficits, right? And if the money doesn't flow back to the emerging markets, which is really 7 billion people in the world, we're going to crisis on our hands. So, you know, the, 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 the real issue is that we don't have a GS global ESG standard yet, right? We have disorderly climate transition, we have divergent recovery, and we have barriers to inter, uh, uh, mediation. And the, all these are with, with, with uh, um, the uh, uh, BCG risk report, which you can read. And guess what? The, when we talk about ESG, the United Nations has only just uh, approved to improve, include natural capital uh, in the calculation of GDP. They've only just have a sustainable environmental economic system of environmental economic accounting standard in 2021. Okay. Now, if you include that into GDP today, GDP would definitely be cut at least one to 2%. You and I know this, right? Okay. And then the government say, well, GDP is slowing. I don't have enough money. I want to spend on this area. And so who gets hurt? The poor. By the way, on ESG standards, the IFRS, the International uh, 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 Financial Accounting uh, uh, Reporting Standards Board, the foundation, has only this 2021 established the foundation to include the uh, environmental standards. So there is no yet agreed international standards. And as a former chairman of the technical committee of IOSCO, who, and I was the, I co-chaired with the deputy governor of uh, Bank of England, you know, uh, uh, you know, um, you know, Mervyn King, who then later became governor, the G22 international standards, uh, and how to uh, develop it. Let me tell you, this is a decade year, I mean, a, a decade long transformation, okay? So we have lots of all these transition to disclosure standards. And at the moment, so if the, if the, if the asset managers and the bank lenders say, I don't want to touch all these non-compliant ESG standards, only the advanced country companies can comply, guess what? You will have a bubble in green finance at the advanced market level and a starvation of finance at the emerging market developing country level, okay? So, you know, so, you know the, 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 the company is getting more active and that's a good thing. But at this point of time, you know, it, it's not that all the companies in the emerging markets are bad companies. They want to, you know, comply with ESG, but they don't know how. You know, for the last week or so, I've been on Zooms with people in, 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 in the stock exchange of uh, Malaysia trying to say, and the, all the companies are telling me, I don't know how to do it. Which standard? How do I, how do I get this? And, 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 and the regulators say, well, we have a standard, but but where's the standard? You, you point out to me, you know, how are we going to do this? So we, the, this is the real issue, right? If you really look at the, where the standards are, you know, the advanced countries have all the light green and all the emerging markets are, you know, are, are not able to comply. So we seriously, you know, have this issue. And Jacques Attali, who was former chairman of the European uh, development Bank, European uh, uh, Bank for Reconstruction and Development, the European equivalent of the World Bank, he basically made the same point as I did, you know, uh, so I won't go into it. And then, of course, most of the developed green bonds are issued in euros, okay, and issued in euros. And of course, Europeans are very happy in this, you know, uh, 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 and, and, and in currency. So that's good news. So what's the fundamental issue? The fundamental issue is that climate change is system change, right? And, you know, look at what the collective action trap that we're in. In Glasgow, you know, in, in COP21, we, the, gov the advanced countries agreed to give a hundred billion climate fund. They still haven't been able to commit to that last year. 
right, in, in Glasgow. And, 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 you know, and then of course, you know, the large companies are now saying, well, we're, we're gonna do this, but, but what about the grassroots level, okay? So we've come to the conclusion that we've got macro thinking, you know, it's global objectives, but local action. That's where change will come, all right? So how do we do that? That's the real trick. That's the real barrier that we need to get uh, involved in. And most local small and medium enterprises, NGO, typically lack know-how and seed money to make that change. The poor have high transactions costs. The, high, the platforms, the tech platforms are able to succeed because they got speed, they got scale, they got scope, and their transactions costs are very low. But all of you know that a lot of them have monopoly power over the, the small consumers, the small P2P, resulting them in charging the small guys very high you know, entry costs, et cetera. And of course, digital finance is the way to go. But how do, if I am a small SME, I don't even have time to, 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 to digitize and, 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 and advertise you know, and, and produce and deliver, et cetera. So, you know, India has got some schemes and we can go into that uh, example. So here is the opportunity that, you know, Sneha and I thought about. If, if you know, and, and this comes from uh, uh, this philosopher called uh, Stephen Tulmin. He said, at the point of uh, modernity, post-modernity, governments are having less and less trust Companies, profit-making companies uh, uh, have shown to be self-interested, uh, uh, okay? The future is actually non-state players. Who are the most trusted institutions in the world today? Transparency International, Amnesty Foundations, Wikipedia. So why don't we now match the huge amount of baby boomers who are retiring with massive knowledge in organization, business, social enterprise, a baby boomer peace call. Get that knowledge wired through a global creative platform to help the millions of multimedia, I mean, I mean micro, uh, this is a very difficult word, we have to think about it, micro, medium, small social enterprises Firstly, through projects, and then once we, and then these uh, micro, medium, small enterprises can share ideas with each other, okay? We match a supply of expertise and funding with the projects at the micro level, at the grassroots level who have the demand, and then do an Alvin Roth private-based uh, platform to link the two to minimize transactions costs for the poor. So we are thinking of actually using the, the, the concept of the NFT blockchain to create how do we regenerate nature through using NFT tokens, okay? Now you young people are much smarter than me in this regard. I am just beginning to explore this, right? So the, 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 the point is that we, how do we get the phila suitable philanthropy loans and CSR funding, the carbon credits, all this, we cannot rely on charity. But if we, you know, like we treat our social enterprise, the global creative platform as a tech startup, we create a Natura concept. And as long as the social rate of return of reinvesting in the earth has a higher social rate of return than the liability side, it's a viable project. But this project will need a sufficient capital to absorb losses because when we reinvest in nature and reinvest in uh, small companies, a, a, quite a large number of them will fail. Now, as a former central banker, development banker, if you use the Basel III concept, 
the average cons the average if the average failure of credit to small scale enterprise is 10%, we add 10% risk premium to the loan that we're going to lend them. And that way actually is regressive. It actually taxes the small and the poor, whereas the rich who don't need money actually get their money even below the, co below, uh, the cost of funds for various reasons that you know. But having worked uh, 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 in, in, in a sovereign wealth fund, the Malaysian one, and visited Silicon Valley, I've some come to realize, my goodness, why don't we go the, you know, the thousand startup and actually use the unicorn idea uh, so that the unicorn uh, profits are able to compensate for the investment in the 999 companies that either break even or fail. And then just like, you know, we, we, we now create private sector cryptocurrencies which the, the mining of which is privatized rather than the fiat money which goes to the government, why don't we use that resource to invest back in nature? Okay, the whole project is that we reinvest back in nature, right? And, and so we mine the Natura, the, we give the Natura to the MSMEs to regenerate nature, the Natura can be used as tokens. This is not currency, okay? Ex can be exchanged for fiat currency or cyber currency, which is then utilized for projects. If a MSE project, and let me give you a simple example. If we have a palm oil plantation in Malaysia, is seen as killing orangutans, uh, depleting topsoil, producing a product, uh, 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 that is that, that may cause cancer, et cetera, et cetera. Suppose we were to be able to utilize 20, 30% and regenerate uh, the jungle back again, you know, tropical forest back again. And we go into the hybrid um, uh, planting, okay? A new technology, right? That minimizes topsoil, uses uh, biogen, uh, um, uh, 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 biodegradable uh, natural fertilizers uh, uh, and uh, pesticides rather than chemical ones so that the water does not get polluted, okay? And if the uh, 20, 30 years later, if the biodiversity produces chemical, uh, produces uh, 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 pharmaceuticals, uh, or for example, the tropical hardwoods have, you know, uh, the, the real value for furniture, et cetera, like that. You can selectively harvest this, you know, uh, on a sustainable basis. You will get an upside uh, unicorn type profits, which then can be, you know, utilized to uh, compensate. Uh, it's like an option uh, profit that you can use to compensate for the average losses for these kind of sustainable projects. Okay, so let me stop here. And uh, I think uh, we've just, you know, got enough time to answer questions. And if needs be, uh, Sneha, my, my colleague in, from Ladakh, will be able to give you, a, you know, some idea of how, at the grassroots level, some of the frustrations that she has in raising funds and getting the right technology. Okay, so let me stop here and open, open it to the floor. Um, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Shang, for the very interesting uh, presentation. Um, so Rahu has raised his hand. Um, anyone else, if you have a question, feel free to raise your Zoom hand, and we, I will call on you, you could unmute and introduce yourself and pose your question to Mr. Shang. Uh, Rahu, would you like to go first? Thank you. Am I audible? Yes. Yes, I can, we can hear you. Thank you. Love the presentation. Thank you. Um, I'm Rahul Tongi. I lead energy and sustainability studies at the nonprofit think tank CSEP, Center for Social and Economic Progress in New Delhi. We were formerly known as Brookings India. I'm a non-resident senior fellow with Brookings and, and also an adjunct professor at Carnegie Mellon. So jack of all trades, master of none. Uh, my 
main concern, I agree with what you've said, but I just worry that we have a disconnect between financial and physical. The rate at which we can just, I mean, the finance world will financialize, securitize anything, but the physical world doesn't keep up and that disconnect just multiplies or it's leveraged which or, 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 or resold, which makes it even worse. So Delta Airlines um, CEO said, I spent 30 million to become carbon neutral. Uh, and, you know, part of me laughs because if you extrapolate their emissions to global, if it were linear, that would be $24 billion to make the whole world net zero, which then prompts the second question, how much of what all we're talking about from the financial sense, especially with offset instruments, is just about the word net? And it's a whole separate discussion. We've done some work. Most of the net is problematic, if not a sham. I totally agree and with any you. Any thoughts? I yeah. totally agree with you. I, you know, I, I don't want to waste my time uh, talking about the, you know, I, I, I already had this discussion at the top level. There is this, what I call green finance with brown hearts. Yeah. Okay. They actually, they just, it's just another shell game. Okay. I want mm -hmm. to make impact at the grassroots level. That's where the real change is going to be. But my problem, you know, I, I, that's not my problem. I'm trying to figure out how do we reduce the transactions cost? You know, Ronald Coase says, you know, we reduce transactions costs. We reduce transactions costs at the high level. We have not reduced it at the low level. At the low level, a poor guy has higher transactions costs than anybody else. Okay, let me give you an illustration. During the pandemic, I go to my favorite noodle store. I said, why aren't you in Facebook? Because everybody's on takeout. He said, the, Mr. Sheng, I have to wake up five o'clock in the morning to buy my vegetables, buy my everything. I don't have time to do Facebook. You know, even just to do a Facebook, I mean, just, just to register to Facebook, right? I just don't have time to do this. So one of the things that I'm gonna do is when our digital school is up and running, I'm going to use my students to volunteer for all these small guys, how to get their, them on Facebook so that they can take, take out orders. Simple things like that to reduce their transactions cost can change the game. All right. So I'll connect you with it. IndieHood. Uh, IndieHood is exactly that same idea for scaling at the Indian level, micro That's transaction right. costing for Indian exactly. volumes. Exactly. Um, right. So, so, you know, there are too many people at the theory level. Okay, I, you know, this is the theory, this is wonderful. It sounds wonderful at the, at the, at the, at the PR level. At the grassroots, nothing happens, okay? And that's why people have lost trust in the elites because they talk, but they do not walk. What I really want to do now is really try to devise this in a way, okay, with people who feel, who think like me, and actually going to design the projects at the grassroots, at the pilot level, so that people can see on the ground that actually smart villages, green villages that will benefit the indigenous people will work. Let me give you a very simple example. You know, 6% of the world's um, uh, carbo uh, consumption is corn. In corn, this I didn't know before. Corn in Amer corn came from America, as you know, and today it's spread all over uh, Asia, uh, Africa, you know, uh, etc. But the Indians who planted corn understood that there is a cycle. The cycle is you plant corn one season, then you plant squash, then you plant beans, and then you actually regenerate the soil. Destroy the pest, destroy the pest, and then you know the third season the corn actually grows better as as, as good. What what as you know from uh, 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 um, uh, uh, Varaja, Varanda uh, Shiva is that the more we use chemical fertilizers and chemical pesticides, we pollute the water and we impoverish the farmer. But the corn production in Asia, and I come, I come from the island of Borneo, okay? 
my fellow uh, indigenous people are doing shifting cultivation. When they plant the corn, if the, the soil is eroded, they burn the forest, okay? They burn the forest because they never learn that they actually can plant the squash, plant the beans, you know, that will regenerate the soil. So, you know, very basic ideas will change people's livelihood. So, you know, what you're saying from India, Rahul, I totally agree with you. We have this, you know, wonderful idea at the high level who talk only, but see no action at the gr grassroots level. This is what we're gonna to try to do. Yeah, I see a, uh, a hand up by, by Jia Jun. Yeah, hi, Mr. Sheng. Thank you so much for this um, very, very interesting talk. And um, I think the idea of using a creative commons for, for both for raising funds for climate finance, as well as for kind of connecting, as you said, the, to the micro level and the grassroots level to, do, to disperse those funds is very, new to me and very interesting. I was wondering um, how you mentioned at the start of your presentation, like the meso level to connect the macro to the micro. And I'm thinking, you know, with this sort of creative commons model, like how would, um, how does the allocation of, you know, climate finance to these grassroots um, organizations or in, um, activities um, would, would work and, and if you, if you've thought about kind of that um, in the work that you've been doing so far, well, let me let, let me share this with you, right? You know, you have you know you know as you know, I come from a finance background, and you know, it struck me that the Amazon.com has a market value that can buy up the real Amazon with loose change. Okay, I mean, you know, you just price it. How much carbon capture of as Amazon has got? You you price the, the carbon. And then you multiply the value of the Amazon, and you suddenly it's not as you know as valuable as uh, as Amazon.com. But you know, it's, I, I've come to realize it's forget about talking. There are too many people who are smart. They talk, they don't act. So what we're doing is actually design the pilot projects, design the pilot projects that will show people that it will work. Okay that it will work. And even just tonight, I was talking to a company director who suddenly said, yeah, this is something that we might be willing to sponsor, okay? So I said, okay, my first thing I'm gonna do is I'm going to actually design the go back and design the project, okay? And actually adopt a village, right? A native village. I mean, indigenous people, as you know, in, in Malaysia, we've got is what we call Orang Asli, the original people, the first nations, okay? And then, you know, what, what is happening is that they are living, you know, uh, uh, in, 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 in the Cameron Highlands where they plant the vegetables using pesticides and um, uh, uh, chemical fertilizers that is polluting all our water, okay? So, uh, I was just reading the latest World Bank report on water and air quality and I suddenly realized that actually in where they are, we have some of the oldest water, uh, uh, um, underground water in the world. You know, uh, um, uh, Changbun, you would know in, 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 in Perak, we have uh, these um, um, cask, uh, 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 hills that actually has filtered water for millennia and the water below is top purity. But the more we pollute like this, that water will get polluted, okay? And, and, and water is, water like data is the new goal. So if we are able to adopt these kind of projects for them, they improve their income they improve the quality of the vegetables that they're selling. And then everybody benefits. They may even, if we design the project right and they have carbon capture, they have also carbon credits that they can get from, okay? But nobody, I mean, I, 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 it's, it's not nobody. I don't know because I have not gone in to see the other projects. And that's why I thought, wow, we, if we've got Wikipedia, we can build this platform 
right? And so myself and people, uh, some people from the University of Glasgow uh, and some Americans uh, in, uh, uh, who are looking at this particular project, we're gonna use advanced income uh, expertise and pilots together with emerging market pilots to do the first pilot of these areas. And then if this succeeds, we scale. We draw the lessons of how this works, we scale, okay? And that's what we're gonna try to do. Now, as you know, if there's plenty of money out there who's willing to finance this if you actually show that you deliver. So the way we think about this is exactly like a startup. We have the series A, you know, uh, a concept. Then we have proof of concept. So we pilot. After proof of concept, we get more money. And then we improve the, the, the thing to see whether we can scale. And then we develop from there. Right? Not for profit. Completely used to regenerate Mother Earth. Okay? I'm a great believer in that. So that's what I'm, you know, uh, 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 a few of us are putting our all not only just our talk, but our money on the table. Sorry, you, uh, I think uh, Avida, yeah. Well, thank you for such a impassioned and I think optimistic outlook. Uh, I have a two points. One, you said the problem is a system problem. I think that's an incomplete description. And I think all human problem created the final work out to be a moral problem. And I do not see in your way of describing it that we overcome that moral problem. Namely, whatever we do, I want to make money from it. Okay. And the second, I think that given the most um, whatever the prediction, what you think you have, like the three waves, uh, recession and the third world war come, eventually nature will have a way of regaining its balance. That's all I want to say, you know. Uh, uh, Vida, I totally agree with you. I, I, I used to be a securities regulator. I was there talking about morality and regulation. And then I realized most companies, when the PE ratio is a difference of three or more, they couldn't care less. <laughs> I hire the PR. I, the, the whole job of the PR department is to make sure that my, my PE ratio, ratio remains high, my bonus remains high, forget about reality, okay? All right? So, but, you know, I, I, I don't blame them. I don't blame them. All I just want to say is, Vida, where is my conscience? If I have a remaining time in this world, I want to do what I can to repair what my generation has destroyed. Your generation, we, I believe we are more or less the same age. We created the greatest wealth, created the greatest debt. We are leaving our children with one not even one tenth, one twentieth of what we enjoyed when I was growing up. I come from the island of Borneo. When I grew up as a student, I could walk from Kota Kinabalu to Sandakan, coast to coast, across the island of Borneo under virgin jungle. Today, 50% is palm oil. Okay, all right. And, 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 and I don't want to go back home because I, when I go home, I cry. I just don't want to do it. But recently when I started understanding that there are projects there which can help my fellow native uh, uh, Kadazan, Murut, uh, Dusun uh, 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 friends who grew up and today are poorer than ever because the soil is gone, the, the, the water is polluted. Do you realize how much a graduate, you know, when I was a graduate in, in, in my hometown, I was earning 2,500 ringgit, which was in those days, 500 US dollars. 
Today, the same graduate in Sabah is earning 1,000, you know, 200 ringgit a month. Okay? And the, 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 the standard of living, the minimum, the poverty level is 3,000. This is ridiculous. So I'm trying to develop projects now to try and help turn this around, okay? And Malaysia is not a poor country, all right? We're, we, you know, we're medium income country, just below the, the income level of uh, moving into advanced country. So we have the resources. The only question is the know-how. And I think this can be done. I, you know, I, 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 you know, I may be totally uh, idealistic, but this comes from somebody who has actually built systems and managed large projects on the ground. Okay. And <laughs> I'm talking to you guys, you know, not because I'm trying to sell anything. No, I'm just they... trying to tell you. I'm just trying to, to suggest to you that there are people out there who are going to try to make that change. May, may I come back with one uh, um, rebuttal? Sort of sure. not quite. If you plot the carbon production versus years, you know, this exponential growth you showed in the beginning. Let's plot the total GDP per person over years. I will not be surprised that there is a one to one correspondence, namely the total dollars produced or GDP produced, including those by Amazon or Starbucks or any of these. Now, I do not see in your system correction there, we actually bring down the GDP. Unless you bring down the GDP, namely our consumption oriented thing, namely the corporation have reduced their profit. I see there's no hope. We have just let nature regain, re regain the balance. Thank you. Uh, wonderful, Vida. I don't disagree with you. There's one slight problem with that thinking. GDP is an average concept. And at the moment, the GDP looks up, the range of that GDP is getting wider and wider. Okay? And that GDP concept does not include uh, natural capital. If you include natural capital, the GDP would not have gone up. The GDP would have actually gone down. And not only gone down, the variance is worse and worse. So, you know, when you look at the macro and then you look at the micro, the micro situation is worse than what is happening. Let me give you an illustration. Okay. Somebody told me that you know, the, the, the multilateral institutions talking about India, the GDP numbers look good, but you actually look at the grassroots level, people are, are really having it very tough after the pandemic, but the GDP numbers look good, right? So the GDP is actually the wrong indicator. Now, I'm not arguing against this. I can spend the rest of my life just playing golf if I think that you know, life is, can, can go on. My point is, we really now need to empower the young to attempt to make that change. And that's why I'm talking to you, to tell you the truth, okay? Because I hope amongst the young, you will have the ideas and the energy to actually make that change in the world. Thank you, thank you. John, yes. Um, hi, John. Can I check with you if you have unmuted your microphone? Am I am I on microphone now? Yes. Now we could hear you. All right. What I what I wanted to share with you is a story of a meeting that I had with a gentleman whom you undoubtedly know, and undoubtedly will appreciate my point. It was back in 19, the early 1990s. I was in Bangladesh and I met a gentleman named Mohammed Yunus. 
and he introduced me to something called Grameen Bank. And while we didn't have in those days the capacity to Zoom and have the kind of personal in-depth conversation that we're having this morning, we nonetheless had the same kind of conversation with many of the same kinds of issues. And the conversation concluded, I want to do something. The point is I was among the very first financiers of Grameen Bank, financed any number of those projects, not only in Bangladesh, but throughout the world. And so I simply wish to table again the story of Muhammad Yunus because you can do what you want to do. I think the world has never been more oriented or capable of doing the kinds of things you're emphasizing than today. I'm amazed at how much money is available at every level for every kind of project, for every, every reason, including making the world a better place for all the obvious reasons Absolutely. you've tabled. This is a perfect time for you to embark upon the kind of project you're headlining. I commend you for it. If I can help you anyway, by all means, call me. I Thank wish you, you every success. I'm, I'm impressed and I think you have, I think you've identified a problem and I think it's capable of projects and solutions. Absolutely. This is, this is why, John, I think, you know, we, we, are, we need to work with people who actually can replicate some of these pilots on the ground. Absolutely. Okay? Absolutely. Right? And, 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 and you, know, you know, whenever, you know, I, I've gone past the day when, you know, I, I can talk, I can sell something uh, and people say, show me the, show me the project. And I, you know, I can't do it. So I'm just going to do it myself, right? I mean, I'm, I'm just going to, you know, uh, go and, and, and adopt projects, uh, persuade my friend to get into it. And then we will see whether it works. And then we see how it be can be replicated. Absolutely. Right? If, I fail, if I fail, that's, that's exactly. fine. I mean, that's, I, I, that's the whole, I that's can, the I can, whole I can, I came. I come out of Wall Street. That's my background. Yeah. I yeah. evolved into the Asian Development Bank for all the reasons that motivate you to do what you're discussing with us today. Right. And right. what I found is that the blessing of my background that I had depreciated is that Wall Street made me a problem solver. Wall Street right. said, look, here's the problem. I, I don't know what the solution is, help me. And so That's we right. would sit around a table with a group right. of well-intentioned people, some of whom were there for capital gains and profit, which is not per se a bad thing. No and no what we did, what we did was structure solutions. They right. were public private right. partnerships, but we structured solutions. And as we evolved those solutions, we learned, we made mistakes, but we were practical people. We were problem solvers. And that's exactly who you are. And those are exactly the kinds of people who will mobilize with you more so in today's world than ever before. So what that's you're right. what you're emphasizing, it's definitely achieving, achievable. That's my. I friend. think so. My Thank reaction. you, John. Yeah. Thank you. That's what you know. Uh, some I, I send my proposal to a, a friend. It's too vague. Okay. I I accept that. I accept all the criticisms. Okay. You know, too optimistic, too vague. You know, too idealistic. But you're talking to some guy who has been working on this problem solving. You know, for, for the last 40 years. So I, I have no problem. Uh, Kantira, I think Kantira wants to talk. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah. Thank you for your talk. It's pretty, I can feel the passion for it. Um, I think, um, yeah. Um, so that just like in class, we also um, talked about like the peer to peer um, marketplace for. Um, like for that would be like more like a personal funds, but I kind of see like a similarity to this in terms of like, you know, like peer to peer um, carbon markets platform in that sense. So um, I'm wondering like, yeah, coming from a policy background, what, what do you think are the roles of like, like central banks or regulators to kind of like um, make sure that, you know, some of these initiatives are successful in the emerging market? Yeah, okay, uh, uh, I just share with you, this is already public knowledge. 
I have been invited by Kun Viratai uh, as a uh, one of the international advisors to the TDRI, the Thai Development Research Institute. Yeah. Okay. And uh, and uh, and the reason is we're, we're, we're former central bankers, right? We're all former central bankers, and central bankers are problem solvers. Okay, problem solvers. You know, we 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 need to understand monetary policy. We need to understand development. We need to understand re financial regulation and financial stability. So it, it you know suddenly you know I I also amongst my for my sins. Uh, I'm also the trustee of the Bank Indonesia Institute, where I do training on central banking uh, and what the, the 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 what finance is coming to. And you know the change can come when the top financial leaders begin to understand what needs to be done. Just to give you an illustration, five years ago, I I made the pitch to Bank Indonesia that they need to build a national balance sheet. Because what was the reason for the 2008 crisis? It was because everybody looked at flows. GDP was a flow. Savings is a flow. They didn't look at the, the, the debt overhang, the fragility of the system, both below the line and offshore. OK? Guess what? They've already built one, all right? <clears throat> And Bank Indonesia has donated as a central bank, you know, a considerable amount of money to 64 universities all across Indonesia to help develop the curricula on development and finance. Okay, and that's grassroots level. And I say, good for you. Yeah. So, we, you know, we, we, we really now need to get our minds off the elites, right? And actually face how do we solve the bottom 50% of society? And when they are doing well, we will always do well. One lesson I learned as a central banker and a policymaker in Malaysia was, if I, if, if I, as a central government, federal government, spend money in the rural areas, the urban areas will boom. Mm -hmm. But if I spend money on the urban areas, the <laughs> money will leak out in foreign exchange. Yeah. So the circulation of money, the transmission mechanism, is far more efficient for local money than global money. Okay, I, I don't have a problem with the global money. I'm, you know, Malaysia is an extremely open economy and it has benefited a lot. But if we don't take care of the bottom 50% of society, we, the elites, are going to get into deep trouble. And we've seen this all over the place. Okay, so to me, the projects that I'm trying to, you know, try to crystallize is exactly at that bottom 50% of society. I'm not trying to help the, the 1%. They can more than, more than enough help themselves. I don't even need to help the 10% or the top 20%. They can take care of themselves. It's that bottom 50 that I, we need to, you know, really make a change for them. Yeah. Well, thank you, Mr. Sheng. Um, I think that's, we're at time now. So I think that's a wonderful note to close on. Um, I think uh, it's been very inspiring to hear from you. I think you've inspired the students who have been tuning in. Um, and it's been fascinating to get your perspective over um, the, the tremendous career you've had um, working in finance and banking. Um, and it's wonderful to see you now bringing that knowledge and experience to, to solving one of the most pressing problems um, that uh, this generation faces. So thank you so much for giving us your time today and for speaking with our students. We really appreciate it. Um, and thank you to everyone uh, who chimed in with questions to Mr. Taylor, Mr. Tongia, and Mr. Chu. We appreciate all your contributions as well. Um, thank you, and uh, we'll make the slides available. And um, if anyone would like to uh, reach out to Mr. Sheng, um, please email me and I would be happy to put you in touch. Thank you. Thank you all very right. much for your advice and, and, you and support, much. especially John and, and Vida and, and, and all of you, you know, your students.